Hi everyone, welcome back to Carpe Diem Sailing. If you're new to the channel, my name is Marco, I'm a Sail Canada cruising instructor, and in today's video I'm going to be talking about some handy bits of personal sailing gear. So the gear that I'm talking about here is, like I said, personal sailing gear. Stuff that you can put in your pocket or hang around your neck and uh, help make your day, your sailing day a little easier. And uh, as usual, I will have show notes. I'll have the link down below. And I have a list of the items, um, eight items I'm going to be talking about today. Um, some of the features you want to look for. And then as well, a price range so that you can uh, you know, adjust your budget as you need it and you know what you're looking for when you go shopping either for yourself or for a gift for a sailing friend. So let's start with the hand bearing compass. So for anyone who's seen my, watched my navigation videos, you know that I'm a proponent in having, always having some kind of a manual backup to your electronic chart plotters. And so the hand bearing compass is definitely an important part of, of that. And uh, this one is the Plastimo Iris. It's about 20 some years old. I've had it for that long and uh, it, uh, it's holding up really well. It's very accurate, easy to read. It glows in the dark, um, easy to use. You simply hold it up to your eye like that, look through the little window, sight through the lubber's line onto your landmark and read the magnetic bearing, which you then plot on your course or you convert to a true bearing and then plot on your chart. Um, so the hand bearing compass has come, the whole range of them. Um, and I'll talk a little bit again, like I said, about prices. So these are all manual. They are, there's a couple of electronic versions as well. So Auto Helm used to make one years ago and they're not available anymore, new at least. You can find them used on eBay. And it was simply, you just hold it up like this, click the button. There was a nine bearing memory and you could just go click, 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 shoot your bearings and then go down and plot them. And they were all converted. You didn't have to write, to waste time writing in a notebook, that sort of thing. The downside for me is it's electronic, again, relying on batteries and software and whatever else is in there. Um, so if I want something as a manual backup to my electronics, I like something that's fully manual and has no issues with, with batteries and power and software and things like that. But if there's something you like, it's something you might enjoy, they are available still um, online used, but they're not available new anymore. Um, the other one that you might want to look at when it comes to electronic uh, magnet or magnetic, sorry, electronic hand bearing compasses is what's called the KVH Datascope. And the KVH Datascope was not only a hand bearing compass, but also a laser rangefinder and a timer. And uh, you can find them used on eBay uh, for upwards of $400 US. Um, if, again, if it's something that you're interested in, uh, certainly give that a shot or give that a, a, you know, take a look at that and see if it's something you might want to look into or consider. For me, uh, this little manual hand bearing compass with glow in the dark, easy to read um, with a lanyard, um, is the way to go. So uh, they range in price anywhere from $25 for a, a sort of a, a cheaper entry level hand bearing compass up to $185 and beyond. Uh, like I said, up to $450 for that, uh, the KVH Datascope. So the next thing I'm going to talk about are harnesses. And what I mean by uh, harnesses um, is something like, so this is an old school chest harness. And you use a harness if you're on deck alone, single handing, at night or heavy weather. Those are generally the main recommendations that you should be you know, tied into, uh, uh, you know, connected to the boat through a uh, harness and a tether and a jack line. And we're gonna talk a bit, a bit more about that. So this is just a dedicated chest harness to which you would attach the tether and the tether would be connected to your jack line. Nowadays, more and more people are going to integral PFDs, inflatable PFDs with built-in harnesses. So whether you use an old style harness or an integral PFD with a harness, you're still going to need some form of tether. And the tether is what connects you to your jack line. So this is a very simple entry level tether with a stainless steel clip that has no safety, there's no lock to the gate. Um, and then this just loops through your D-ring and then back through itself. So very permanent attachment on the body end, which means that if you're being dragged by the boat or if the boat's sinking, you need some form of device to cut the webbing uh, to break free. Um, so if you're going to be using this kind of a, a, a harness or a tether, I should say, make sure you've got something on your per person to cut that, cut that tether away. Moving up 
and become making you know, more, a bit more sophisticated. We've got a tether with a locking clip on the jack line end and then a snap shackle at the body end. And that means that if you are being dragged or if the boat is sinking, you can cut yourself away by simply pulling this little lanyard here and then it opens up. There's a possibility that this could open up by accident and you could not, you know, you could lose it. So it depends on, you know, what you, how you feel about these different things. Um, this is a six, uh, generally they're six foot standard length. And then this one used to have bungee cord in it to make it a little bit easier to use. Some of them come with these locking clips on both ends. Once again, if you do that, make sure you've got some way of cutting uh, away. Um, if you're doing any, you know, offshore racing, that sort of thing, there will be certain standards that you must um, adhere to. And so at that point, you'll have to go with whatever they, you know, tell you that you need to be using. Um, there's also uh, these, the high end of the range, these twin tethers, three foot and six foot with locking clips. And that means that you can actually leapfrog up the jack line if you, um, if you need to. And also you can tie yourself off short because these tethers and harnesses are not necessarily going to keep you on the boat. Depending on the size of your boat and where you're tied in and where you have your jack lines, you could end up over the side and in the water, but you're still connected to the boat and it's a matter of now getting you back on the boat. But they are, you know, and even then that could be a dangerous situation as well. So they are not there, you know, I wear these as a backup to my other methods, which is one hand for you, one for the boat, moving around carefully, that sort of thing, watching where you walk, you know, and, and moving around the boat carefully, staying on the high side, all of those sorts of precautions come before that. To me, these are a fail safe and then I've got my inflatable PFD. If that fails and I need to cut away, um, that's my ultimate fail safe is my, is my inflatable PFD. Um, prices for harnesses are 90 to $190 for that chest harness and 80 to $70 for a tether, depending on whether you want to go with that super, you know, the basic tether um, all the way up to the twin, you know, tether with the two locking hooks. Um, just a quick note on jack lines. Jack lines are specifically meant to clip into. So tethers are not to be clipped into lifelines and things like that. They're meant to be clipped into a dedicated webbing that's meant to hold, you know, the line and it's been load tested. So a dedicated jack line that's actually meant to be, to be, you know, held a human being sort of hanging on it um, that you clip onto. And uh, most people now use webbing. They used to use, you know, steel cable and things like that, but just use a proper dedicated jack line. Don't clip into anything like lifelines and things like that. So moving on, we're going to talk about flashlights, uh, which are a requirement. Waterproof flashlight is a requirement for Transport Canada on boats in, in Canada. Um, but I'm speaking more of these little uh, portable LED headlamps, which are really nice and, and light and easy to put in your pocket and you've got them with you anytime you need it if you're you know on watch at night on deck or down below looking into some corner of your boat um, they're pretty handy and something you want to look for in a headlamp personally i use rechargeable nickel metal hydride batteries and then i have some AAA rechargeables or AAA uh, alkalins as a backup but you can also buy some that have rechargeable packs uh, built into them um, your choice you decide what you want to you know what you want to spend your money on um, some other features that you want to look for is a waterproof uh, rating, an IP rating, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. And as well, uh, you know, if it's dimmable, um, so this one is actually dimmable and um, it can change from, you know, white light to red light, which is a pretty handy thing to have, you know, doing night watches to protect your night vision. So now the IP rating. So IP um, ratings are ratings to determine waterproofness of these different electronics. So that yellow one, this yellow one here is an IPX8, which is the highest level of submersion that you get in the IP rating system. Um, there is an IP9. I'm not going to get into that. It's high pressure, uh, but generally you're talking zero, no, no protection to eight being um, protection of three feet or one meter or greater. So IPX7 is three feet, up to three feet of submersion for up to 30 minutes. When you talk IPX, the X means that it hasn't been tested for solids like dust intrusion. They're simply tested for water. So IPX7, IPX8 are very waterproof for any sort of sailing, you know, getting splashed, that sort of thing. IPX7, IPX8 is what you're looking for. Um, nickel metal hydride rechargeables with an alkaline backup or a rechargeable battery pack. Um, and red and white lights. The white light dimmable is definitely a feature that's useful if you want to write, read in your bunk at night. All right, enough about headlamps. 
Um, just uh, so yeah, cost, price range, $25 to $200. So $25 for an entry level one to $200 for the fancy ones that are pretty powerful um, with built-in you know, rechargeable battery packs. Next, I'm going to talk about um, marine binoculars. A proper set of marine binoculars, I think, is a must-have on any cruise serious cruising boat. Um, and what makes a marine binocular is, what I'm looking for, is armored, waterproof, and a designation of 7x50. So 7 is the magnification, 50 is the size of the objective lens. Anything more than seven becomes too shaky to actually have a good picture on a on a say on moving sailboat. Um, so most, if not all, marine binoculars are seven by fifty. The fifty is the millimeters of the objective lens. Here you will find eight by forties, seven by thirty fives. You know they might be great for sightseeing, bird watching, things like that. But for a proper marine binocular, you need a large objective lens that will let in a lot of light in low light conditions. Um, these are Steiner's, so Steiner, Fujinon, Zeiss, West Marine has a, has a line as well. Uh, the high-end ones like Steiner and, uh, and Fujinon um, you know, are, are definitely well worth the price. They are a lifetime purchase. They're anywhere from seven to a thousand, $700 to $1,000. Um, the Fujinon Polaris is, uh, is our, the choice, the binocular of choice for the Canadian Navy. I've worked with the Navy quite a bit and I've seen how rough they are on their gear and the Fujinon Polaris has held up extremely well. So if you're looking for a good armored waterproof marine binocular, you know, the Steiner Navigators, uh, the, the Fujinon Polaris, um, but then the West Marine as well. Entry level, $99 all the way up to the Steiner Commanders at uh, 3000 or sorry, $1,300. Um, another thing I was going to mention is there are some other features you might find on your binoculars you may or may not want. This one I did get with the built-in um, compass, which I actually find of limited value. The compass isn't damped well enough for my needs. Um, as well, the illumination is electronic. Uh, the battery and the bulb either or both have failed. It doesn't work anymore. I haven't been able to. I haven't actually gotten to get it fixed. I don't use it off that often. I use my little Plastimo with the glow in the dark. But, you know, a built-in compass might be something that you, uh, you might find you know, useful. Um, next, we're going to move on to, we're going to talk about inflatable PFDs. So inflatable PFDs, back in the day, I started with the Mustang uh, Crew Fit, I think it was called, a very basic manual inflate, as well as a, an, a, an oral backup. Um, and, uh, and then they started coming out with the auto inflates. And the auto inflates at the time were not that reliable. And they've come a, a long, long way. So um, I still use a, sp a Mustang. Um, but I also have the spin lock. So the spin lock, this is a spin lock deck vest 5D. My wife uses a spin lock deck vest light. And then now they've come out with a spin lock Vito, which was actually designed with um, the Volvo Ocean Race Cruise. And uh, so they, they've become quite a bit more sophisticated. So some of the features you're looking for in a, in a good, certainly an offshore or high end uh, inflatable PFD is going to be um, a built in harness crotch straps, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute, um, a spray hood, illumination. This one also comes with a lifting strop that to help you pull, pull you up out of the water, um, as well as a cutter built in underneath behind here. I don't find that cutter to be, I'm not sure how easily I'll be able to get at it if I'm being dragged by the boat. It might be easier to reach in my pocket for my rigging knife, but a whole bunch of different features, Mustang, uh, spin lock, crew saver, there's a bunch of others out there. Um, Look and see what the features are, what the money, you know, where your budget lies and what you need for your, your, your type of cruising. Um, certainly offshore, you want a high-end PFD and crotch straps for any serious offshore or inshore cruising day and night. You want a set of crotch straps on there because what they'll do, not only will they stop the PFD from popping up over your head, but they'll also keep you floating higher, which means better protection, less hypothermia, better protection from waves, better visibility. So definitely think about having some crotch straps uh, for any serious um, offshore or inshore day and night cruising that you might be doing, especially in, in heavier weather. Price range, $189 for West Marine entry level to $399, $400 for the Spinlock Deck Vest uh, 5D or the Vito, um, which is a little bit more comfortable. The 5D, the hood, the spray hood is quite bulky in the back. I don't mind it. Some people have um, expressed, you know, that they don't find it quite as comfortable. So, you know, before you buy, check them out, try them out, make sure they fit comfortably. Uh, they do have to fit properly. There's no point in having these things not correctly fitted so that they don't work when they need to. Right, so look into the different uh, features that you might you might need or want and, uh, and you know, make sure you get what, you're, what, you, what works for you. Next thing we're going to talk about, so I mentioned cutting away and things like that. We're going to talk about, um, about rigging knives. So rigging knives, you know, range from a very traditional, this is a, an old buck 
what they call the buck yachtsman, which is a standard flat folding, uh, stranded, standard straight folding blade with a locking marlin spike and then a little attachment for a lanyard here. Uh, years ago, I, when these were available, I worked in a knife store as a teenager and it was my dream to have a sailboat. And I, you know, I did eventually buy one of these used on eBay once I got my, once I got my sailboat. Um, but I remember when I was dreaming about sailing, I certainly wanted one of these and now I, I have it. So the very traditional, you know, um, nice, you know, traditional rigging knife, uh, but as a rescue knife, uh, there are better options. So another option um, is a fixed blade. This is the Russell belt knife or Russell boat knife. Again, also used by the Canadian Navy. This one has a partially serrated blade, which is handy if you need to cut things away quickly. Um, and the sheath comes with a, a marlin spike and the marlin spike has a shackle key built into the handle. So this one um, lives hanging on the handle in my companion way and everybody knows where that knife is. So should anybody need a knife in a hurry to cut something quickly in a, you know, you know, in a safety situation, the knife is there and everybody knows that it's, it's there. And then, pardon me, in addition to that, I carry this one um, in my pocket. So there's a little lanyard connects it to my pocket. It's the Gerber Easy Out, which means I can actually open it with one hand and it's a fully serrated blade. It is a marine rescue knife. It is a lock blade. It's a serrated blade, as I said, and it is open. You can open it with one hand. Um, so pretty light, comfortable, easy, you know, visible, easily seen, and it fits in my, it's in my pocket no matter what. So if I need a knife in a hurry, I've got it in my pocket. And otherwise we've got my other Russell belt knife hanging in the companion way. Now, talking about cutting rigging away and knives, more and more boats are moving on, to, moving into uh, this uh, more these more exotic uh, types of lines. So this is Dyneema, and Dyneema is almost it, as, as as strong as steel, if not stronger. Um, I it, it's very expensive. I don't have any Dyneema anywhere on my boat, but I certainly know lots of people, and I've certainly been to the forums where they talk about Dyneema standing rigging, you know, Dyneema and Spectre rigging in your you know in your running rigging, as well as Dyneema lifelines, things like that. So should you ever need to cut Dyneema, cutting it with a, a straight blade is almost impossible. The serrated blade will go through it, but it gets kind of gets hung up. Um, so it is tough stuff to cut. And I did an offshore survival course uh, a couple years ago, and they're talking about how to cut away rig rigging. And the best thing to use for cutting Dyneema or Spectra is one of these little ceramic kitchen knives. So I've got a little clip coming up right now of a demo using my uh, Gerber Easy Out to cut the uh, Dyneema as well as the um, ceramic kitchen knife. And you'll see the difference. I'll have a close up of the end of the line and just how cleanly this cuts through this Dyneema. So if you have Dyneema or any kind of exotic standing or uh, running rigging on your boat, make sure you have a few of these. They're not expensive and they, the best thing to go through this exotic, um, exotic, uh, these exotic lines. Yeah. This time we're just gonna try one, just okay, one saw right. down like that. Yeah. Okay. And then we try it with this. Okay. There you go. There you go. Here you can see the two ends. So this end here, which isn't cut all the way through, was from the serrated knife. And then here, and I don't know if it'll focus clearly enough, but here you can see the part, uh, the cut from the uh, ceramic knife. So it's really smooth. And I just went through it literally like a hot knife through butter. Price range for rigging knives is anywhere from $25. The little ceramic knives are 10 bucks or something like that. Anywhere up to a $100. Uh, for this one with the leather sheath, fixed blade, and marlin spike. We're gonna talk a little bit about sailing gloves. Not a lot to say about sailing gloves. Basically, there are, you've got different brands, Harkin, Ronstan, Gill, West Marine. They typically have some kind of a leather palm to protect your lines from being burnt by lines. Um, they can be a full finger or they can be short like this, uh, half fingers. Um, I personally don't use them that often. I do try to rely on using my winches and using you know, the tools on the boat. But in some situations, in an emergency situation, uh, in racing, you don't always, you know, you're just taking shortcuts and you're pulling on lines. I have burnt my hands quite badly once on a spinnaker halyard and uh, my wife-to-be at the time uh, bought me a, my first pair of sailing gloves because I, my hands were just ripped raw by this halyard. I couldn't hold the spinnaker at all. And that was, you know, a rookie mistake of trying to raise a spinnaker n with nothing in between the line and the end of the, the load other than the shiv at the top of the mast. 
Um, so I do have them. I do keep them in my bag. And, uh, you know, certainly when I'm racing, I do wear them. And in other situations, you know, going up the mast is another one. So when I go up the mast personally, I do go up in a, um, in a climbing harness and I pull myself up the mast um, and then people, you know, take up the slack in the halyard. Should anything ever happen and you slip and you fall um, and you don't have a backup, you know, grabbing onto shrouds, things like that with bare hands is going to hurt. So sailing gloves, again, going up in the rigging, definitely a good idea. Price range for sailing gloves are $25 to $40, depending on how fancy you want to get. Gil, I think, makes some really fancy racing gloves that are full-fingered, padded, all that sort of stuff. Um, so leave it up to you to decide you know, how you want to use and what gloves you want to get and how you want to use them. The last thing I'm going to talk about is something that I'm pretty excited about, um, and it's also quite revolutionary. And it's this item, a new item on the market designed by a Canadian sailor in Toronto, and it's called the Sea Arch. And the sea arch, and I'll have a picture of what it looks like in the water deployed um, so you can see what that looks like. Um, as you can see, it's basically a, an inflatable tube that comes out of this pouch. And so you go into the water. So this is worn around your waist. You pull on this tab and then that inflatable arch comes out and um, it's got reflective tape on it. It's about six feet tall um, and it helps you float, helps you be seen, and then it can help you help you recover, get back onto the boat as well. It can be used as a recovery tool, either around the arms, um, under the legs, sitting in it, you can actually recover. I am planning on doing uh, a video on these. These were the two versions. There's the Sport, which is the lighter version, and the Mariner, which is the heavier version. I have both, um, and I am gonna be doing a full review on this. These were given to me uh, free to be reviewed by the manufacturer. So thank you very much, Sea Arch. Um, it is really quite an interesting product and it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next 5, 10, 15 years to see, you know, how much this might revolutionize um, the, you know, rescue uh, sort of device uh, market. Um, so quite interesting. Um, you know, I will uh, do a video later on the summer when I will go in the water and we'll try it out and see how well it actually works. But in the meantime, you know, for anybody who's uh, sailing in a dinghy, uh, in a canoe, kayak, stand-up paddleboard, you know, maybe you're you're, you're out in your stand-up paddleboard um, away from your boat. You don't want to wear a PFD necessarily. These are not meant to be re you know, replacing a PFD, so I still recommend that you do wear a PFD and the, this, but it's up to you. You decide what you need, um, and it is you know a handy um, adjunct to a PFD. So I'll leave that with you. Um, price range, 149 to 159 and then the rebuild or the re-arm kit is uh, 25 or $30. That's all I have for these uh, pieces of uh, sailing equipment. I hope that you enjoyed this video and I hope that these, uh, this, the advice I've given you is helpful for um, next time you're out buying some sailing accessories and that some of these will make your sailing a little bit better. See you in the next one. New episodes go up every second Wednesday at 6 p.m. See you next time when I talk about the magnetic compass and converting bearings. Thanks for watching. Until then, I wish you all fair winds and following seas.